Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving math problems out of this book here. The official guide to the revised GRE. The second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You are going to need it. Today we will talk about, we will not solve a problem, but we will talk about a couple of concepts. Concepts dealing with, and this information you will find in the book on page number 274. They talk about it, right, right there I indicated there, page number 274. The two concepts, concept dealing with central tendency and dispersion. What does it mean when we talk about central tendency? Central tendency simply tells us the point where the data tends to cluster. The point, the point where the data, the observations, tend to cluster. Where do we find most of them? Where do they tend to cluster? And dispersion is ex exactly what is what it means exactly what it says. It tells you how the data is, is dispersed. How how is the observation uh, spread out? How spread out? How spread out? Or how dispersed? The observations are, and in both in both cases, we have three tools at our disposal, which which will do the job. When we talk about central tendency, we're trying to measure how are the we're trying to figure out where is the data clustered, where do they tend to come together, where do we find most of the observation. Well, first tool is the mean. Mean tells us mean gives a very good idea of where we expect to find most of the observations. If a teacher gives an exam. Uh, there are 100 people took the exam or 40 people took the exam, doesn't matter how many people take the exam. And, it, and she tells you that the mean score on the exam was 72 out of 100. Well, that gives you a fairly good idea. It gives you a notion, it gives you an idea. You can picture it that most people score somewhere in there. If it's 70 is the mean, most people probably score between 65 and 75 or so. If the mean happens to be, she gives the exam and she tells you the mean score was 45 out of 100, that's pretty bad. Most people score pretty low. So, mean does a very good job. What else do we use? Another tool that we can use, which which does a which does a, which which conveys the same concept, is the mode. Mode tells you what is the most frequently appearing observation. So, in the same exam, if we tell you the hundred people took the exam and the mode was forty-five, well, that's not pretty good. That means most most people the the, the largest frequency. Not, I shouldn't say most people, but the score that appeared most often in the exam was 45. A large number of people got 45. That also gives you some idea as to how they are spread out. There might be, of course, some people who scored in the 70s and 80s and 90s, but there is a large number of people who, that was the most occurring, observe, uh, most occurring score, 45. On the other hand, if she tells you that the mode was 85, well, it, again, you get some idea as to where the observations lie. That's where most of the observations happen. 40 was, for 85 was the most occurring observation. That tells, that gives you the notion of how it's clustered. Where is it clustered? Is this toward that end? Is it toward this end? Or is it right in the middle? So the exam was given and the teacher tells you that the mode was on a scale of one, uh, this, this goes from zero to 100 on the exam. And she tells you the mode was 50. Well, that's pretty central. Uh, it's, it's pretty central right there. 50 is right in the middle. That is the most, most uh, that is that's, that's where the most people score 50 points. Do you understand? On the on the tool that we on the tool that we use is the median. And what does median tell you? Again, in the same exam, if we are told that the exam was given to 40 students and the median score was 65, again we can picture it. 65 tells us half the people score below it, half the people score above it. Again, it gives you a very good idea as to how well, how badly, or how well the class did. On the other hand, median was 35. That's not pretty good. That means half the people in the class scored below 35. It gives you some idea of where they tend to cluster the data. 
when I say they, I mean the data. Data is plural, you understand? So those are the three tools that we use here. It tells you where the observations tend to cluster. In addition to that, it's also helpful to know how spread out the data is, how dispersed it is. Is it very tight around the mean or is it very spread out? One of the tools that we use, very basic tool, not a very sophisticated tool, but it does do, do a job of giving us some notion of how spread out the data is, is the range. Range will give us a very good idea as to what's going on. So again, in the same exam, if she tells you that the range of score was from 20 to 80, well, that's a pretty low, pretty big range from 20 to 80. On the other hand, if she tells you that the, in this exam, the range of score was from 55 to 85, that's pretty tight. And most people score between 55 and 85. Well, not most people, everybody scored between 55 and 85. It tells you that everybody, nobody scored below 55, nobody scored above, above 85. It gives you a very good idea of where it is clustered. Range. If you go a little bit more sophisticated, if you want to be a little bit more sophisticated, we have a tool what is known as again the range, it's the idea of range, but it is what is known as interquartile range, which it was which is what we did yesterday on day number uh, 392 and day number 391. We talked about interquartile range. This is still a range, obviously, but instead of giving you the range of the hundred percent of the population, this is when we talk about range, it tells you. The, from the least to the greatest for the entire population, the whole class. In the quartile range will tell you the range, the range of the of the middle 50% of the observations. So again, if she tells you that the interquartile range was between 45 and 65, that tells you 50% of the people. 50% of the class is scored between 45 and 65. It also tells you that 25% of the class scored below 45. It also tells you that 25% of the class is scored above 65. It gives you a very good idea of how spread out the data is. And it is known as interquartile range. It is the range, but it's the range of the middle 50% of the population, not the entire population. And finally, the most sophisticated tool that we use, where we actually make use of every single observation, where we need to know where we need to know the value of each single observation before we can figure out the, the before we can use the tool and that tool is that tool is the standard deviation standard deviation the standard deviation looks at the deviation how much it deviates each single observation how much it deviates from the mean and we do some calculation with it, but we do not add up simply the, uh, the deviations from the mean. And when we, when we talk about it tomorrow, in the next video, when we, when we talk about how to measure the standard deviation, I will go into details. But we take the square of the deviation. The reason we take the square of the deviation, deviation is because if we were to simply take the deviations from the mean and simply were to add them up, of course, the negative deviation and the positive deviation will kill, kill each other. And it might give us the notion, it might give us the impression that there is no deviation, that everybody is around this particular score, whereas in reality there might be big. For example, for, for example, for example, if, if there are two students, if there are two students, if there are two students, one scores 40, one is scored 40, not 40 like that, one is scored, one is scored 20 points and the other one is scored 80 points, the mean is 50. The mean is 50. But if you simply look at the deviations from the mean here, the deviations from the mean is 30 here, deviation from the mean here is positive 30. The deviation from mean here is negative 30. It is 30 points below the mean. This one is 30 points above the mean. Now if you were to simply add up the if you were to simply add up the deviation from the mean, it will be zero. Hence giving us the impression that there was no spread. Everybody got the same score. Standard deviation of zero means every single observation is the same. Zero standard deviation means every single observation is the same, whatever and that, that becomes your mean. Everybody gets the same score, which, which, which we can clearly see, which we can clearly see here, it's not the case here. There were two people in the class who took the exam, two people took the exam, one guy, A got 80, other guy got 20. And if you were to simply add up the deviations from the mean, the negatives cancel out the positives, which is why we take the square of it. We take the square of it. And hence, now it gives us 1800. And as I said, tomorrow when we do the work, we'll, we'll figure out, we'll, we'll go into what we do with that figure. 
but this this notion standard deviation is the most sophisticated of the three that we just mentioned the regular range which is the range of the entire population all the observations from which tells which which is simply the difference between the greatest observation minus the least observation it captures the entire population or the range of the middle 50 percent of the population interquartile range or if you want to be more sophisticated we talk about standard deviation which takes into account every single observation and it looks at how does this observation deviate from the average observation average of the observation average of the population the mean of the population and instead of simply adding up the dif differences we take the square of them we'll talk about it tomorrow as to why we do that why can why could it's, if that's the problem is that if the problem here problem here is that the positive cancels are the negative why don't we just take the absolute value and there is a reason for that as well we'll talk about that as i said on day number 394 but today this is what i wanted to talk about understand the two concepts and understand the three tools the central tendency and the dispersion central tendency tells you where the data is clustered you can look at the mean you can look at the mode you can look at the median now here's the last part i almost forgot it i was about to close the video when you and, and we talk about when we talk about dispersion you can talk about the range or the range of the middle 50 percent of the population interquartile range or the standard deviation let's do the one last thing i need the room here to raise it now when we're dealing with When we are dealing with normal distribution, when we are dealing with normal distribution, in normal di what do we measure on the y-axis? You know, what is measured on the y-axis? When we draw the normal distribution like this, what is it that we are measuring on the y-axis? On the y-axis, we have frequency. Frequencies. It tells you how often a given observation occurs. And this highest point there, that tells you that this, this data this score, whatever it was, was the most often occurring, most occurred most often, because it's the highest point there. And this 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 score, whatever this score was, not too many people got it, that score, only a few people got that score. Not too many people got this score here. Well, this many people got this, this score. Whatever this happens to be, it tells you how many people got this particular score. So if the mean happens to be 50, and this happens to be 70, it, it tells you how many people got 70. 70 is the score here, you go up there, it tells you how many people got 70. It tells you how many people got 10 out of 100. How many people got 50. In the case of normal distribution, this is the mode. This is also the mean. It is also the mean. In, in the case of normal distribution, the distinction between the mean, the mode, and the median ceases to exist because they are all one and the same. The mean here is 50, which is also your mode, which is also your median. Why? Because, as you can see, it's very symmetric. 50% of the population are to the right of the 50, 50% of, pop 50 of the population are to the left of the 50. This is your median, this is your mode, this is the most often occurring, most, most frequently occurring observation. It's also the mean. So in the case of normal distribution, these distinctions go away and they are, all of the three concepts are one and the same. But when we talk about standard deviation, well that's different. Look at this observation, look at this distribution and look at this distribution here. As you can clearly see, the red one, well first of all, the mode is different, the mean is still the same. The mean of this observation, well this observation will have a different mean, but anyway. As you can clearly see, the red one that I drew here is very tight. The standard deviation of this guy, the standard deviation of the red one, is going to be less than the standard deviation of the black one, the one that I drew first. Let's, let's cross all the numbers. The red one, this, the standard deviation of the red one, the standard deviation of the red one is less than the black one. Well, you understand. We can draw one more if you like, which is going to be even tighter. We can draw one more distribution where the distribution is even more clustered around the mean, which tells you that it's a very small standard deviation. So the measurement, measurement of standard deviation will tell you how spread out it is. 
which of course you can also ascertain from the range and interquartile range, but standard deviation is, is more sophisticated. Tomorrow we'll solve the problem where we look at the steps, what steps are involved, how exactly do we go around calculating standard deviation if a, if a set of uh, observations are given to us. But we must know each single observation because the idea is to calculate the mean of those observations and then ask ourselves how much does each of these observations deviate from the mean. In order for us to know how much each observation deviates from the mean, we must know the observations and we have to be able to calculate the mean of the observations. Do you understand? And we cannot calculate the mean unless we know all the observations, obviously. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Where we learn, as I said, the actual steps that are involved to calculate the standard deviation of a given set of data. There are five steps. We'll do it tomorrow. Bye now.